everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer on Billboard.com, Variety.com, Access, and other publications, uh, welcoming you to another session of Things We Said Today, our almost relatively weekly show where we talk about nothing but the Beatles past, present, and to come. Let me introduce uh, our two co-hosts, first from the state of Maine, who uh, is enjoying uh, sunshine and 80-degree temperatures right now, I'm sure. Um, our musicologist, uh, uh, who uh, wants to know why uh, Kendrick Lamar got a Pulitzer, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, uh, Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. We're not going to debate that today, right? Kendrick Lamar, no. No, <laughs> no. okay. And... From the state of Connecticut, the host of the uh, syndicated show, uh, Every Little Thing, uh, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hello, Steve. Hi, everybody. We have a special guest today. Uh, we're gonna we're welcoming back, after a, a long absence, Kit O'Toole. Hello, Kit. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. It's great to be back. Okay, and let, I'm gonna run through. So we're gonna run through the news real quick, and uh, then we will get to the main part of the discussion. We have several news items. Uh, first of all, um, this past week, uh, BMG announced that uh, Ringo Starr has ex- signed uh, an exclusive worldwide publishing deal with them, covering his songs from his Beatle days and his solo catalog, which is really kind of interesting that the Beatle catalog is in there, too. Uh, and it, It's interesting only two also, songs. Well, I mean, the fact, <laughs> the fact – well, not according to this now. Yeah. According to the, to the press release says, what goes on, flying, oh. don't pass me by, Octopus's Garden, right. Dig It, and Mag- Maggie May, and including Susie Parker. Wait a Interesting. Minute. Susie what? Susie Parker. That's little rarities, including Susie Parker. Christmas Time is here again, 12-bar original, and Lost Paranoia. I'm reading right off the, right off the wow. press release. Interesting. Huh. So, so yeah. they're, they're including his interests in things that they're credited all for right so mm-hmm. it's like really 25 percent of those songs but i'm i'm cur- curious i mean that's the first time i've ever heard anybody that's true parceling out beatles songs that way so uh, i wonder so- you know if if someone decides to record as i think the smithereens did um christmas time is here again they have to deal with two publishing companies it looks like it maybe yeah. even maybe even three at this no two yeah one for the <laughs> You know, and ATV. one for Harrison. Yeah, one for oh. Harrison. Yeah, I that's mean, that's right. Oh man, hmm. I know this is getting really complicated, isn't it? <laughs> but in any event, the Smithereens yeah. recorded "Christmas Time Is Here Again." I thought they did. Maybe they didn't. Didn't they uh, do a no. sort of a Christmas album that had stuff like that on it? Somebody recorded a cover of it. I uh, somebody did. It. Yeah, I can't. If it's the not weaklings. the Smithereens, who? The Weaklings just did it. Ah, oh, I see. Yeah, maybe they okay. did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm wait a minute. I'm looking it up online here to see who who actually covered it. Let me see if it comes. A lot of people have done. It. Smithereens did it. Uh, the The Weaklings is not listed here. REM, the Custard Kings, <laughs> Rico Pierce, who I've never heard of. Nope. And the Beat Bugs, which I believe is that <laughs> cartoon series. It's the kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> There we go. And Ringo has covered it. And, and Ringo, right. yeah. I didn't mention Ringo was on there, but yeah. Uh. But anyway, okay, there we go. So there, that's, uh, that's that. The interesting thing to me about this is that it, they're also saying it's for his future compositions. Right. So that also means that Ringo has intentions of making more music. You know, and it's not something that I take for granted because, you know, he is 77. He's made 19 albums. His albums don't really sell that well. But uh, this does cover anything that he might do in the future. Well, so to me, that's encouraging. That's more of a that's more of a uh, a PR term, really, because I mean, honestly speaking, press releases are written that way. I mean, I I, I we we assume he's going to continue to record, and I'm not trying to trying to say anything otherwise. I'm just saying that's a public relations kind of term. Well, and uh, also but, also a living person who composes who signs a new publishing contract i think is always going to have the contract include future stuff or else why would you be you know i mean you could right. have, you could sign it mm-hmm. to administer your past catalog 
but if you're still an active performer composer it you know your your future stuff's going to be included i would think you know yeah naturally. oh yeah especially okay. well in, in a in a deal like this yeah yeah okay but it says right. there's over 150 titles in the catalog hmm. so for a lot of people that are not aware of how much ringo has written or co-written uh that gives you an idea right there i know that that part is kind of is kind of interesting because yeah you don't you don't think of Ringo as a composer. I do. He's, so he had a slow start, but if you consider that the Beatles' official catalog was only like two, something, what was it, 204 tracks or something like that? Right, um, right. And not all of those were, of course, originals, at least mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, Ringo is, in a way, <laughs> over 50 years caught up. Yeah, well, I, guess, I, I, I guess I guess so. But anyway, okay. Uh, next next piece of news is um, the Liverpool City Council is going to uh, do some redevelopment in the Matthew Street area, where the uh, Cavern Club is now located. Which is it, I, I, and it says the aim was to bring uh, this is a BBC story. The aim was to bring an enhanced and more coordinated Beatles tourism offer to the area. Can't, uh, Alan, you've been there. Uh, how did I mean? Yeah, I mean, I, I, to tell you the truth, I can't see how you can bring more Beatles tourism into the area since virtually everything in the area has something to do with the Beatles. When I was apart from the cavern, when I was there, there was I think a, a, a Beatles themed record store just across the street, <laughs> and uh, you know, and everything else that you see around there, if it isn't specifically quote Beatles themed. It's Beatles themed in the sense that it was there when they were there, and so it's a historical place that's part of the Beatles story. So I, I'd be interested to know exactly what they're going to do to make it more. Well, the last sentence here says the plans could involve the redevelopment of derelict and underused buildings and the creation of a, quote, more defined and usable public open space. Hmm. So it sounds like they're going to do some tightening up. But also they're going to look at the buildings that, you know, that need to be uh, upgraded or remodeled or, something, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I mean, it's a typical redevelopment project is, is what it sounds like. I was there in 2000 um, and I'm just I was just thinking as, as we're talking. Yeah, I, I don't remember, you know, I mean, obviously the cavern, is, as you mentioned, Alan, and, and a couple of the record stores. all, But I yeah, I don't remember as much that there was that much to do around there. And so it probably, and it, you know, this is 18 years later, so I haven't been there since, since then. It might look different. But I do remember thinking at the time that it could use some, you know, not too much modernization, but a little bit more, you know, a little, maybe a little brighter, a little more. And, and I can see them saying, you know, more open space for, you know, maybe some outdoor concerts, some other festivals. They have some, I know, but I don't think it would hurt to, to redevelop uh, that area. It'll be interesting to see what they, you know, they're being a little vague there, it sounds like, as to what right. they're, you know, yeah. precisely going to do, but I'll be very interested to see what, what this is going to be. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, they're trying to keep it looking attractive, which is, which, you know, you would want for something like that, you know, which is basically a big part of their income. Except that, so, I mean, historically, didn't it look unattractive? So they're sort well, of yeah, making it, it, an, it, yeah. an attractive scene of what was not an attractive place when the Beatles yeah. were there. Well, at, at the, I'm, I, let me, and this is probably a bad comparison, but I'm going to compare it. Disneyland has been remodeled zillions of times, and it looks, you know, and very little of it. A lot of it does not look the same as it did in '55, and so I think they're just kind of looking at keeping it looking nice, you mm -hmm. know. I mean, in that, you know, in that kind of, in the same frame, you know. Um, yeah, but I see what you're saying, mm -hmm. Ellen, because you know you don't want it to look plastic and and you know fake, and I mean you do want to keep some authenticity. You know, that's, yeah, that's you want to see, yeah. like on the corner, you want to see a guy with long sideburns and sort of greased back hair and a razor blade in his hand. You know, that's right. what you want when you're going on Matthew right. Street. Right. <laughs> okay, I don't know if I do, but, but cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was they'll good until the knife part. <laughs> <laughs> they'll put up more statues, that's what they'll do. They should do whatever they have to do to preserve it. 
so that it's as close to the way it used to be. Mm-hmm. That's well, how I feel. I mean, yeah, I, that that would be you know that would be nice. Uh, um, I just have a feeling though that it, you know for modernization they'll they'll probably do a little of both. Uh, uh, Ken, yeah, maybe probably put, right put an too. elevator in the cavern and. Uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, I think I think we've gone on long enough with that. Um, the story that got a lot of buzz on Facebook this week is the story that Ed Sheeran has been r- rumored to have been cast in a new musical comedy film that envisions a world where he's the only one that, that remembers the Beatles. <laughs> it's and and. and it, it says that the film is understood to have the working title "All You Need Is Love," which is interesting. But uh, you know, and everybody, uh, the story I put up, this was uh, the story I put up on on um, my Beatles page on Facebook, ha- it was written differently. But it had a lot of people going, "What? What are they thinking?" This makes a little more sense where he's where he wakes up as the only person who can remember the Beatles, but. How are they going to logically make that believable in the script? I I can't guess how, but it's very strange. I mean, obviously the attraction here for every for movie going audiences of movie going age is Ed Sheeran, and you know he's very popular and everybody knows him. I mean, and he's you know he's very well uh, regarded. I know. Um, you know, Peter Asher was, is a big fan of his, and and I, I'm so are a lot of other people too. I mean, he, he's he his talent is well known, and you know, I don't know. This sounds this is weird. Yeah, is, I think it else? sounds promising. I mean, you imagine really, if you woke really. up. Imagine if you woke up and you were the only one who remembered the Beatles. You could write that whole catalog. <laughs> Put out oh, an that's, album. That's, that's true. <laughs> I mean, that's this true. really has potential. <laughs> well, you got to admit, it's it's a real unique idea. Mm-hmm. It sounds like I mean, it almost yeah. sounds like the type of idea that somebody said, "Let's do something nobody else would ever do." <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll be interested to see what they do with it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, you know, Kit, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm I, I I don't know. I mean, I guess I guess I should be more open-minded and and uh, and see. But yeah, that is that is a kind of an odd premise <laughs> to, to put it mildly. Uh, also, Ed Sheeran. I mean, I totally see, as you said, you know how popular he is. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, sells a lot of records, but um, you know, acting ability. I wonder. You know, that's I haven't seen that. So who knows? I mean, that's. You know, I, okay. I guess we'll just have has, to wait and see. Has he acted? I, I haven't. Uh, I'm not a big movie, um, fan of current movies. I mean, has I, he has he acted before? The only thing I can think of, and I haven't seen this, but I heard that he did a guest spot on. I think it was Game of Thrones because he's a huge Game of Thrones. Oh, fan. really? Okay. Yeah, and so he did like a little, <laughs> like a little bit part in it, and uh, he didn't okay. exactly get stellar reviews. <laughs> okay. All right. Is there any word as to whether or not there'll be Beatles recordings used, or maybe Ed's performances of Beatles songs? This, the two stories I saw mentioned nothing about that. So, I mean, it could be or it couldn't be. I don't know. But there was no mention. And, and we all know how hard it is to get Lennon and McCartney uh, music rights. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, the fact that the Beatles are even mentioned... You would think that there is some kind of, you know, some kind of talk going on with Apple, but I don't know. I don't know. Well, and, maybe things are opening up because we've been hearing about Vivek Tiwari's TV series and that he can actually use Beatles recordings for it. Well, there's there's a difference there because the Vivek, to, uh, the you know, the Brian Epstein thing that Vivek Tiwari is doing is Brian Epstein. And I know. That has and that has the back. That has, I mean, that has the support of you know of the of the Beatles themselves I mean and they're not you know as you have said they're very picky about what they allow their name tacked onto at least I think so yeah you know, I agree but it's it's only recently with this and good old Frida you know that it's that's something like that uh, has has happened so maybe 
maybe things are opening up more. Well, maybe and they're, across, they're, across the universe, let them use the songs, not the Beatles recordings, but you know, the right. songs were used. Right. And, mm. Who knows? Uh, we'll probably, I'm sure we'll hear more about this, uh, you know, as time goes on. Um, the next little piece of news is a short thing. Um, a, a lot of our listeners probably heard about the passing of Milos Forman, the a film director who did One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Amadeus, and Hair. But he's also known for a a quote that we has have authenticated. I hadn't seen it i don't remember seeing it before or at least i didn't uh, remember hearing it but he said i'm convinced the beatles are partly responsible for the fall of communism now we could do that we, we were talking about this before we started taping and we we're going we could do a whole show on that one <laughs> uh, but uh, uh interesting but anyway there's something for you to think about finally there was a picture or actually two more things um there was a picture of yoko ono posted on her Instagram account on the 10th that was captioned first day in the studio feeling good. And if that's true, if she's back in the studio. That's hell of news. That's a hell of a good news. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. And I think a lot of people will be too. Finally to just today, uh, Julian's auctions and the hard rock cafe and the, and Beatles story announced uh, what they call discovery day, coming to the Hard Rock Cafe in New York on May 17th. And what that's going to do is they're going to have uh, experts there to evaluate Beatles and rock and roll memorabilia for free. So if you're in the New York area, you can um, have your uh, have your stuff uh, evaluated. And, it's a, and the press release says, for more information or to pre-book a free face-to-face valuation, Visit Beatlestory.com slash events. Okay. And, and there's one other thing. Uh oh. No, since she since she mentioned Yoko before, mm-hmm. one of her songs is actually being used in a TV commercial. Hmm. So uh yeah, I've been noticing in the last week or so that Yes I'm Your Angel is being used in commercials now for PetSmart, which makes a lot of sense because many of us look at our pets as being our own angels. So uh, congratulations to Yoko for that, because I don't recall there ever being a time when any of Yoko's songs have been used in commercials before. I don't either. I, don't, I, can't, ima- I can't imagine one has ever been used. That's, that's uh, interesting. I assume it's a, it's a, is it a cover version? I assume. Oh, yeah. It's not no. Yoko's recording of it. No. no. Okay. Mm. Hmm. Wow. Anyway. They could, they could have used Dogtown. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the, the, okay. Ah, I'd let you guys loose and what happens? Boom. <laughs> anyway, this week we're going to talk about underappreciated Beatles and solo songs with Dr. Kit O'Toole, the author of the Deep Beatles column. Right, Kit? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Uh, see, gave gave Kit a plug for the for Deep Beatles. Um, and I think what we'll do is I think we'll go through these – one at a time. Do, is that how we want to do this, guys? One song at a time, uh, starting with the Beatles songs. Well, um, these are all songs that these are all songs that Kit herself has picked. Right. These are not ones that yep. we picked. So right. I just want to clarify that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so Kit, we'll we'll let you go through these one at a time, and we will react one at a time. So, okay. So. Sounds good. Go ahead. All right. All right. Well, do you want to, uh, let's uh, kick off. We'll sort of do this chronologically, I guess. We could start with uh, "There's a Place," which I think is is, but you know, it's it's another example of how you know the you know B sides and album tracks uh, that the Beatles just sort of tossed onto them. You know that that they were just as stellar in many cases as the big hits were, and this is an example. I've always just thought the the harmonies on this are just you know just classic uh, classic Beatles type harmonies and I also think it, it's important that it's an early indicator of where the Beatles were going you know particularly Lennon McCartney in their songwriting that this is not just uh, you know about romantic love you know this is about contemplation you know this is about um, reflection. You know, it's uh, it's it, you know, of course, similar to uh, Beach Boys in My Room. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, a similar idea. 
and that uh, being, you know, that that love is wonderful, but being, you know, to to be alone and 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 be with your thoughts, uh, or if you're feeling and low and blue, as as um, you know, as they sing, that you can go to this to this space. And I just think for a a so-called pop group of that time, you know, 1963, that was a pretty cerebral, you know, song to do. And I, I just think it, it holds up, and, I, and again, it's just an indicator of where they were going to go. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you're talking about contemplation, you know, things like I'm only sleeping, tomorrow never knows. And, of course, John would continue that with, you know, watching the wheels and, and many others. But this is where it started. Um, and so I, I've just always thought this was a standout track. Mm. Okay. Um, Alan? Um, but Kit, did you feel it was underrated? Oh, I think so. Absolutely. Because mm-hmm. it's, you know, now I, I hesitate, you know, because I know among Beatles fans, this isn't like a super rare track. But it's it's amazing to me how many casual fans have never heard of this. Mm. You know? And, uh, and hmm. that's why. Uh, it's I, seriously. I mean, I've I've just been astounded. When I wrote about this in Deep Beatles years ago, I mean, there were people who said, "Oh, I forgot about this." You know, mm-hmm. It's just amazing to make to me. I think it could it could be because in the U.S. at least, it, it apart from um, I guess introducing the Beatles, it never got on an album. You know, it mm-hmm. didn't make it didn't make it onto the early Beatles, which is most of the Please Please Me album where it used to live or still lives mm. <laughs> um, right. and even when they when they put together hey jude with all of the bits and pieces and singles they left that off too i think it wasn't until the rarities album that it turned up mm-hmm. so maybe Same thing with misery yeah and, yeah and i think maybe in the case of those two tracks maybe if you can argue that it's underrated it could be because of that you know because uh it just was less available although you could always get you know i think there was a tolly single that had it on it and uh, mm-hmm. you know yeah. once people started collecting the stuff you'd you'd get it one way or the other but um, yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah i i it agree was... with what kit said i mean it, it it does remind me also of the beach boys in my room um hmm. except that like you were saying, kid, it, it it goes. It actually does go a bit further, and in in the sense of being cerebral, in that for the Beach Boys, the place that they're going to go is in their room, and for John, it's in my mind. You know, it's uh, right. So I I, th- I think that's an interesting difference. Both great mm-hmm. songs. Absolutely, Ken. It's interesting you use the word cerebral because that's the word that Paul used. I think in the book many years from now when he described it because yeah he was pointing out the fact that you were going into your mind and so like the songs you were pointing out it kind of paved the way for those i also think of strawberry fields in that regard Mm -hmm. you're talking about your mind maybe your imagination that kind of thing so yeah of the early beatles compositions it's not one that you hear all that much about Mm -hmm. and they had a lot of hits in their early years and that was a B-side. It was the B-side of um, Twist and Shout. And I remember playing There's a Place even more than Twist and Shout when I was a little kid. So, yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. Usually songs that are not hits tend not to get the airplay. It's kind of hard for me to imagine. When you when you say deep tracks to someone like me, none of the Beatles catalog is deep. Right. <laughs> you know? If it's been released, it's like the alphabet. You should know all the songs. <laughs> yeah. But for yeah. the average person who doesn't really study it, who basically knows the hits or album cuts that are very popular, what's on the Red and Blue collections, a song like There's a Place is a deep cut. And so um, I definitely think it's it's an underrated song. Okay. Um, in my, my, I'm going to take a different tack here. And I'm going to say I think more of the song in a melodic sense than in a lyrical sense. Um, I, I actually, it, because the song is is a relatively early song, I'm not really certain, although uh, obviously if Paul says says it was, I mean, there's nothing I can say, but it, sound, it sounds more to me like the, the lyrics were kind of a, a second thought, and it was really the melody that was important there, because the, the song itself... The way the song is structured, I think, is 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 better than the lyrics, and 
So I, I think that's the important part of the song. But in any event, I mean, I, I, I mean, if Paul thinks otherwise, you know, what can I say? But just listening to the song in my head, it really sounds, especially for a 1963 song, it sounds more like it was less serious than the words, than the word. It was more serious lyrically than it was. I mean, more serious melodically than it was lyrically. Hmm. Anybody want to? Anybody want to yell at me on that one? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. To me, melodically, it's kind of primitive, really. Really? Yeah, okay. yeah. I think "Please Please Me" is a far more developed song than um, than "There's a Place." It's you know, it's pretty simple. I mean, I like the song. I, I don't I don't mean to sound you know critical of it, but I don't I I you know I, I gravitate more towards the words on that one. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, you know, I don't think they probably would have heard the Beach Boys in my room by the yeah. time they did this. Right. But I wonder if they knew, because they've mentioned West Side Story, uh, I wonder if they knew Leonard Bernstein somewhere, which oh, the first line of which is, there's a place for us. Mm-hmm. Well, in fact, yeah, uh, Paul told Barry Miles um, in, that, in that book that Ken just mentioned earlier that they loosely based the song on the lyrics from somewhere. Ah. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. He, he told me So that's, yeah, very, not that I'm surprised you, you point that out, but very astute. <laughs> not mm-hmm. surprised. Uh, interesting, too, is uh, John said in a, a 1980 interview that he view, viewed it as sort of an, he said, it, my attempt at a sort of Motown thing. Huh. And I'm assuming, you know, maybe means, you know, the harmonica, um, you know, I, that doesn't jump out at me as much, I have to admit. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, but uh, that's, uh, he said that was one of his sources of inspiration, too. Okay. Okay. Let's go to, let's go to song number two, Kit. All right. Song number two, one of my all-time personal favorites, I'll Be Back. And Alan just mentioned a minute ago about how he, you know, thought that melodically and all that uh, uh, there's a place wasn't quite as, as interesting. This, to me... I, the chord changes just do it for me. Mm. Yeah. I just think I yeah. love, love the chord changes. They're so, it has such a, a melancholy um, sound. It's, uh, and of course, John in, uh, in 1972, uh, in an interview with Hit Parader, you know, like he did with many of his songs, said, oh, it was a nice tune, but the middle wasn't that great. Well, I, I have to <laughs> respectfully disagree <laughs> with, uh, with Mr. Lennon here. You know, and as we know, it started out as a as a waltz that he he wanted to, he, he originally conceived of it as that. But when they tried it, the lyrics were just too hard to, to sing it. That so then they switched to four four. Uh, interesting, you know, too in the early um, versions, it's they uh, used electric uh, guitars rather than acoustic, which I can't imagine because I just think the acoustic guitars. That's the other thing that makes this for me. Mm-hmm. Um, that that the the lyr- the Again, it just accentuates how gorgeous these chord changes are. Kind of like There's a Place, I also like it because it's, again, it, it shows the Lennon and McCartney, you know, further composition, uh, their their experimentation and composition. You know, there really isn't a chorus to this. Um, it's, you know, basically three bridges that, mm. that anchor the whole thing. Right. You know, if you look at it that way. And so, you know, again, who is, who is doing that? you know, and, and pop songs back then. You know, it has such a, the lyrics, you know, are, are uh, really revealing a, you know, a falter, you know, the, the conflict and despair over, you know, kind of a faltering, really delicate, you know, fragile relationship. Um, and there are just so many great lines from this. You know, you could find better things to do than to break my heart again. That's one of, I mean, that's a, that to me is, is such a, a standout line. You know, he's really revealing his his inner conflict. It is just such a a complicated, just, you know, without using too many cliches here, but just a deep song to me. And I, (laughs) it's just always going to stand out. This should have been a hit, (laughs) in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why. You know why it's an album track, but uh, but so that's that's my second pick. Okay, Ken. Kit, you sound like me. (laughs) <laughs> I, I've picked this song several times and I brought it up on this show 
many mm-hmm. times for the same reasons you just said. And, you know, most songs typically have, uh, you know, two verses and a chorus, then back to the verse. But like you just said, there's three bridges there. It's very different in terms of the way that it's structured. And just the way that it starts off, it's in a, it's in a major key in A, and mm-hmm. then it flips automatically to A minor right at the beginning of the song. Yeah. And to do to take a twist like that was very unusual. And um, I just think a lot of work was poured into this song, and it's only like two minutes and 20 seconds. It's packed with a lot of work put into it. To have mm-hmm. all these different sections strung together, mm-hmm. you know, even the part where John sings, I thought that you would realize, that only appears there. You know, it doesn't repeat again. So it keeps you interested by having all these different sections strung together the way that it does, and it flows so perfectly well. I really think it's a brilliant piece of work and very overlooked. Okay. Alan? Yeah, see, I have a um, a hard time thinking really of any Beatles tracks as overlooked because, you know... The Beatles tracks, like, sort of like I, you know, like what Ken said about how you know if the Beatles put it out, it's like a letter of the alphabet. You should know it. You know, um, yeah. but um, yeah. Uh, so I I don't know about the overlooked part, but yeah, you know, I, I I agree. It it's a great track, and there's a lot of really nice touches in it that I just love. And uh, one of them is like right in the. Uh, section that Ken mentioned, you know, I, I thought that you would realize that part, you know, while John sings that line, you hear the accompaniment doing this interesting sort of chromatic descent, you know, he's, he's singing, you know, ah, I thought yeah. that you would realize, and you hear, da, 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 da. it's, you know, it's, it's just great sort of contrary movement. And um, that's the kind of thing that, that always catches my ear, but also the harmonies. I mean, it's, it's just yeah. a beautiful track. And to me, now, I don't know whether this is because I grew up with the American albums and, you know, eventually set them aside and listened to just to the, pretty much just to the British albums for a very long time. But I still have trouble thinking of this song as being on Hard Day's Night. It, to me, <laughs> seems to go with the album we were talking about last week, Beatles for Sale. Thematically, you know, that major to minor thing at the very beginning, the... Uh, you have better things to do than break my heart again. I mean, just it just seems to belong with Beatles for Sale, and that could be because I think I heard it a lot on Beatles 65 um, mm-hmm. with those other tracks um, when I was growing up. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting track that, for me, sort of slides between these two albums, and... Um, uh, but but it is a great track. So mm-hmm. that's a really good point, though, about how it it sounds like it would belong more on Beatles for Sale because mm-hmm. uh, it does it it does it's because that is a bit of a you know it's a darker bit of a darker album and it has and I mean, acoustic many songs guitar are, too acoustic guitars the and again you know the, the some of the the other songs and the, the chord changes are are very different so yeah this does seem like it's it's it sticks out a bit on the Hard Day's Night soundtrack. That's, mm-hmm. that's a really good point. I would love to hear somebody cover this with ele- with electric guitars and do a real, you know, kind of. I mean, this is <laughs> I, it, this has always been kind of, uh, you know, one of those. I guess I, to use Kit's term, a deep favorite. I mean, I've always this song has has always had a special place for me. I've always loved it. And you can imagine John, you know, strutting, I mean, you know, bouncing up and down, singing it. And, and, and yeah. you know, uh, it's just a fantastic song. The the chord changes, the words are, are comparing it to to There's a Place. This one is not as innocent, you know, and that's another okay. reason. And that, that that's another reason, you know, that, it, that this is really nice. Why this hasn't been... You know why this has has kind of stayed buried is a is a real mystery, you know, it, because it is such a fantastic song. That I don't understand. Uh, um, maybe it, you know, in the crush of, you know, some of the other songs they were promoting and everything. That, that's why. But it, it it really did not deserve to be buried that way and to be you know to to be somewhat obscured. It really doesn't. Uh, it's a great song. So, um, here, 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 here. Kit, <laughs> next. 
All right. Next we have, I, I think this is one of their not only a bit more overlooked, but more important songs, mm-hmm. um, which is The Word uh, from Rubber Soul. And uh, the reason I picked The Word is, first of all, I mean, I like the song generally, but lyrically, again, this is another shift. You know, and to me, this is, um, you know, I kind of, I use the terms, you know, Beatles, like from, you know, maybe Rubber Soul on, uh, though you could argue even a little bit before then, but, you know, Beatles (laughs) 2.0 is what I call, you know, when they're starting to, you know, shift away from from the earlier stuff. And the word, to me, this is where they start, you know, really shifting um, into Beatles 2.0, because... The, the word, I mean, this isn't, the word is about love, but of course it is a, you know, not strictly a romantic love. This is, you know, I call it, you know, love, love with a capital L, <laughs> you know, that it's a, it's a, a, a larger sense. And to me, I mean, this is a preview of the summer of 67. Um, you know, it's, it's just um, a, a change um, in tone and, and a preview of all you need is love and, Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I just think uh, it's interesting how John takes on the role of, I mean, he's, he's almost, you know, it's something that he has just discovered and wants to tell everyone about. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not just a, an emotion. He calls it, you know, the word is just the way. Uh, it's you know, everywhere I go, I hear it said in the good and the bad books that I've read. And, and he, you know, and now th- this is the real the main line here. Now that I know what I feel must be right, I'm here to show everybody the light. I mean, he's, he's you know, here to deliver a message. And it's just, to me, it's, it's so different than, you know, what we were just talking about in the previous songs. You know, this is, this is a larger message. And again, he would go on to... Uh, well, all of them would go on to discuss this topic more, and uh, also I, you know, I like the guitar in it. Um, of course, uh, George Martin uh, plays uh, the harmo- harmonium in it, and great, wonderful harmonies. Um, you know, that's of course a Beatles trademark, uh, and that they continue it in this. So, but I think thematically, it's a very important song because we're really, as I said, we're starting to see that shift in topic you know, and tone of their songs. So that's that's why I picked that one. Okay. Uh, Alan? Um, yeah, I, I, I can't disagree. Uh, it, it, I suppose to the degree to, that anything can be an obscure Beatles track, this one, it, it doesn't get covered a lot. It doesn't get, mm. you know, you don't hear it an awful lot unless you're playing the whole album. Um, but uh, I think John has talked about the line of connection between the word and all you need is love um Mm -hmm. so in that sense it sort of in a way very purposely is a a a preview of well i guess you can't say it was purposely a preview of the summer of 1967 because they didn't know when they did this no but but it Mm. (laughs) but it, it does seem to be um that he was sort of working on the same idea um, and perfecting it over several years, starting with the word, culminating with all you need is love. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, you know, for me, um, all the tracks on Rubber, Rubber Soul are love songs from different kinds of perspectives. Um, it, it's like, you know, not that love songs are uncommon, but to have an album where just about every track looks at it from a different perspective is sort of interesting to me. And the word, Mm -hmm. you know, holds its place there by being not about romantic love, but about the concept of love as, you know, uh, an empowering thing, you know, for the world Mm -hmm. generally that, you know, John was working up to annoying his love. So yeah, good choice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything Alan said. I mean, it really is. It's the start of the universal message, and it, it is a precursor to All You Need Is Love. Mm-hmm. And um, I just love, like Alan just said about Rubber Soul, all the songs really are about love, but they're different angles and different perspectives. And, you know, some relationships work out. There's a lot of them that do not in Rubber Soul. But um, the word takes a whole different turn by making it more about, you know, the word is love for the world really and i love the the changes in the music there especially towards the end where there's that instrumental passage then they they start singing say the word love say the word love over and over again which is a little bit different from 
what they sing in the rest of the song. Instead mm-hmm. of say the word and you'll be free, but just keep repeating say the word love. And it's just, um, it's a very different way to end the song. Mm-hmm. I always like when the Beatles introduce something brand new to a song that wasn't in the rest of the song before that. And then they end the song that way. Mm-hmm. Kind of like Ticket to Ride was. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and yeah. uh, you know, Paul was very proud of the ending of, of Ticket to Ride where they where they, they sang the My Baby Don't Care part, and that was nowhere in the rest of the song. You know, but the word is kind of like that, the way it ends. Mm-hmm. I think there may also be a, um, you know, a quasi-religious element to this, too. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, I, I am, uh, you know, a Jewish guy. It's not my lit, but um, <laughs> I believe the Gospel of John begins with, you know, in the beginning was the word. And I kind of suspect, I can't really say for sure, because it's not me, but I kind of suspect that anybody who was raised studying Christianity would have made that connection. You know, the song's called The Word, and John is saying, you know, the word is love. I I kind of, for you people who did grow up as Christians, is is there anything to that? Is it, did did it have any resonance? I, I, I did, and I, yeah. I, to be honest, it, it didn't hit me that way. Mm-hmm. But that's an interesting, that's an interesting thought. There's, yeah, there's, um, as far as, you know, uh, songs that I mean, you mentioned, all you need is love. I happen to be looking in um, David Rowley's uh, All Together now, and he connects it with "Give Peace a Chance," hmm. which is, which Ooh. is interesting. However. My interpretation of this song is that you can smell the marijuana in this song so badly. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so I mean, so much it's unbelievable. And I think I think that's what's really here. I mean, I think they were uh, they were smoking they were smoking while while they were doing this one. That's there's no question about it because you can the way the words run. Spread the word and you'll be free. Spread the spread the word and be like me. Spread the word. I'm thinking of. Have you heard the word is love? The it's a the rhyming is so simple. It's so fine. It's sunshine. It's the word love. It didn't sound like there was a whole lot of intellectualism going on here. It sounded like they were just doing it. You know, they were they were making it real easy on themselves. Uh, um, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking here. I mean, that's not to say I don't like the the song's awful. I think that, but I think that's basically what was going on here. Mm-hmm. No. Am I wrong? No, no. They actually, John and Paul, I mean, I, I can't remember which one said, oh, yeah, I think it was Paul, that they were stoned when they wrote that. I mean, yeah. absolutely. And so you can see, I mean, you can see it. You I can, can hear, see that. Yeah. Absolutely. But, you know, whether intentionally or unintentionally, as the case may be, I, I'm not sure. But it just seemed like, again, you know, I, I just remember when I first started getting into the Beatles, when, you know, I, mean, I, I started getting into them in the 80s um, when I was in uh, eighth grade. And, and as I, you know, started going on, this was a song that really stood out to me that I just thought, wow, you know, they're talking about something different now. You know, mm-hmm. this is this is not what they were talking about before. And it just always struck me as a song that does. And, you know, and yeah, the drug culture plays a part in that for sure. Right. I mean, it, it does. But it just to me, it, it just was a, a preview of, of, as we said, all, all you need is love. And, and it, you know, it just really struck me that it. I thought, wow, I mean, this is what was explored in 1967 they were ahead of the curve there <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They were pretty amazing again whether they intentionally or unintentionally mm-hmm. yeah uh okay uh next one kit all right uh next one is one that i uh, it's a george one and i um i just always appreciated this for its offbeat qualities uh i want to tell you uh from revolver now preface this by saying yes this is not a super super deep track but i do think it's something you don't hear you don't hear it on the radio right um and i think it's underappreciated in terms of how innovative it is specifically that that galloping you know dissonant piano that absolutely fascinates me about that this song and it's and that is the perfect accompaniment to what uh george harrison is singing about in the song which is I, and the the English major in me loves this. It's about words. It's about language. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that that he's you know, and he said, and I mean mine. Uh, the the lyrics addressed. He said the avalanche of thoughts 
that are so hard to write down or say or transmit. And of course, he says constantly, my head is filled with things to say, but all the words, they seem to slip away. You know, he's trying to, you know, perhaps if we really want to read a lot into this, this could also be about, you know, how he progressed as a songwriter. Mm-hmm. You know, the the act of songwriting. Again, that may be overanalyzing it, but, uh, but I mean, mm-hmm. you could certainly, you know, but what's, what is interesting is then at one point when he says, you know, I feel hung up and I don't know why I don't mind. I could wait forever. I've got time. And that reflects other songs that uh, not just the, the he wrote, uh, but particularly John uh, about the, the benefits of slowing down. You know, um, uh, turn off your mind, relax and float downstream, surrender to the void. Um, You know, I'm only sleeping, keeping uh, an eye on the world, going by my window, taking my time. You know, it's it's that same kind of thing that in some ways, George, you know, wants to to, to spill all these words out and wants to communicate. But on the other hand, he's saying, but, you know, I need to slow down. I've got time. I need to, you know, think this through. Uh, the harmonies are tight, as always. Um, you know, I feel like a broken record saying this, but, I mean, the harmonies are, are just, uh, you know, uh, perfect. And I love at the end, as the song fades out, that vocal that Paul does. The, the uh, I believe it's Melisma, is, is how you, you pronounce it. Um, you know, the, the Indian uh, style of singing. And, uh, you know, it's kind of his interpretation of it, where he... He, he sings the word, he holds the word time while os- oscillating among various notes. And I just, what an interesting, you know, addition to that and, mm-hmm. and reflecting George's continuing interest in Indian music. There's just so many fascinating aspects of this song and, mm-hmm. and some, you know, experimental kind of stuff. So, uh, so that's why I chose this one. Okay. Uh, Ken? Uh, it's a track I really love. But then again, I love all the Beatles songs. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I sometimes think of the beginning of the song, how it fades up. It reminds me in that regard with, with Eight Days a Week. Sure. I love the way that the song ends with the harmonies fading at the end there, kind of like Good Day Sunshine does on the same album. And um, just everything about it, great melody, great hooks. I love the drum fills that Ringo mm-hmm. does there in between the verses. Yes. Really powerful, makes a big difference. I think it's kind of significant that George chose to lead off his tour of Japan with this song. Yeah. It makes for a really good opening song in a way. Yeah, it's an outstanding track. You know, I don't think, uh, <laughs> you know, all the Beatles songs are good, as I said. I think George, <laughs> I love all of George's stuff. You know, he may not have given us as much as Lennon McCartney songwriting wise, but every song to me was a winner. You know, mm-hmm. you've got the classics there. You got the lesser known songs, but you know, less was more with George and the Beatles. So, okay, um, for me, the the George's singing is what propels this song. I love his his vocals on this song. Yeah, I think that's what really lifts this song, maybe more than anything. Uh, I mean, the instrumentation is good too, but I love his vocals on this. Um, and it's it's too bad, uh, you know. I think the title probably contributes to the fact that um, it kind of gets forgotten a little bit, but it, it really shouldn't, um, because the, the the lyrics are very philosophical. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so, but yeah, it, it, this is this is a great song. Anyway, so it, let's see. Is that Alan? That's it? Oh, Alan. Oh, Alan. Yes, Alan. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alan. Alan, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean good. to bypass you. Let's go ahead. Yeah, I mean, for me, I I really like the texture of this song. Um, as as Kit mentioned, the the piano, the combination, really, the guitar and the piano, and the sort of the slow gallop of the accompaniment. You know, it it's it just uh, it, it's sort of a standard rock track and not a standard rock track. I mean, standard rock mm-hmm. instrumentation, but it's different in this way that George was getting to be all the time. I mean, he has three songs on Revolver, Taxman, Love You Too, and this, and they are three absolutely different kinds of songs, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. Two Western, but they're very different, and then Love You Too is Indian. So, yeah, it, it really, you know, I think the three of them together just sort of show 
how George was developing so quickly. And uh, I, I can kind of see, I want to tell you, as I think as, as Kit said, you know, possibly also be about not just wanting to tell you, but wanting to write songs to tell you mm -hmm. and uh, the, the way his songwriting was developing. So, yeah, a definitely interesting track. Definitely not one you hear all the time. Okay, Kit, uh, the last Beatles song. Yes, last but not least, we uh, return to George, and um, and I picked For You Blue. Now, part of the reason I picked this is, you know, when I write the Deep Beatles column, it's so interesting, some of the reactions I get. When I wrote about For You Blue and I Me Mine, you know, separately, I had some readers say, why are you wasting your time writing about that song? That's <laughs> nothing. I mean, I, it was really weird. The, the reactions I got for both those songs. Really? You know, they thought, yeah, that they seemed to think, oh, they were the weak links of, of Let It Be. And, I mean, you know, not true at all, in, in, in my opinion. And, um, you know, and For You Blue, I enjoy because it's it's just pure George Harrison. You know, it's, um, it's not as, it's not experimental, uh, like I Want to Tell You or Love You Too or you know, the, you know, the songs Alan just mentioned. This is a return to his roots. Uh, but I also think you could say this is a return to the Beatles' roots as well. I mean, this is, you know, the, their music is, is uh, Kent draws, uh, you know, from uh, blues and country and, and all, and as well as rock and a bunch of other uh, genres as well. But this song is more about blues and, and country. And, you know, and I like how uh, George uh, uh, talked about uh, that he said it was a simple 12-bar song following all the normal 12-bar principles, except that it's happy-go-lucky, <laughs> which I thought was mm. great. You know, not a not a typical blues song. And he just sounds like he's having fun recording. You know, all we hear about is how horrible the Let It Be session, you know, get back slash Let It Be sessions were. They were all fighting. And, you know, this is an instance where they sound like they're having a great time and and you're it's like you're eavesdropping a jam, on a jam session, you know, a really really good jam session. Mm -hmm. But you know, and I I think it's um, and, you know, and also uh, I love the slide guitar on it, which you know, of course, this surprises many people that it's John playing that, not George. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I I think he, you know, I'm not saying John is a master was a master slide guitarist, but I mean he got you know got the job done, and it's just and you know hearing John, George egging him on and go Johnny go, I mean it's it's just uh, you know really makes you smile. It's it's I think a, a charming um, song, and you know again I think it just brings the Beatles back full circle to their roots. I think it uh, and also as I said it just showed that there were moments toward the end. You know when all we hear about is how much they were fighting. That there were these moments where they come together, no pun intended, and uh, and really just enjoy performing. You know, enjoy collaborating and 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 enjoying that chemistry that they <laughs> had. So no, I don't think this is a weak link at all. I think it's a it's just a, a really charming song and and has its merits. Okay, uh, Alan. Yeah, I don't think it's a weak link either. Um, I, I think Let It Be, generally speaking, is a weak album, um, but <laughs> it's as, <laughs> it's as good as a lot of other stuff on there. And um, I I don't necessarily think it's the best of the songs that George played to his friends during the Let It Be sessions. Um, yeah. I think you know a lot of those things that ended up on All Things Must Pass were you know maybe better songs than For You Blue, but For You Blue is kind of fun. I mean, it's kind of yeah. a you know it's a blues, and uh, it has John playing you know a, a lap slide, and uh, it's you know it's kind of uh, you know it's light but it's fun. Mm -hmm. I kind of like it. I mean, I've 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 never sort of begrudged it its spot on Let It Be. Let's say. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really, I really like it. Um, I think, given the, you know, given the the nature of the Get Back album, it fits in perfectly because, you know, Get Back was supposed to be a the Beatles warts and all, and this has a very kind of rough quality to it. Um, and I love the the fact that uh, George uh, 
brings in Elmore James uh, yeah. in this too. I think that's that's kind of that's kind of cool. Um, Elmore James, for those who and I'm sure most everybody knows, but Elmore James was a slide guitarist, a blues slide guitarist, who's considered a pioneer uh, of that form of playing, and it was very cool for George to to mention him. And the and the slide guitar solo is 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 very cool. So, but yeah, this is this is a a, a really good song, and and I wouldn't I wouldn't call this I wouldn't pull this down at all. I think it's one mm-hmm. of the it's one of their it's one of uh, it's one of the better songs on Let It Be for sure. So, mm-hmm. anyway, Ken Ken, how about you? I kind of agree uh, with uh, what Alan said. Two key words: light and fun. And that's what I think of with uh, with this song. It's kind of difficult for me. I wanted to separate the song as a song itself. I like the song a lot. It is kind of difficult when you think about, as Alan said, all the songs that George was writing at the time that ended up on All Things Must Pass that they worked on, which are stronger to me than For You Blue and I Me Mine. Although I do, I love I Me Mine a lot. Yeah. Um, but... Um, yeah, uh, when you think that those were the two songs the Beatles used in Let It Be, it's like the only mistake <laughs> to me the Beatles ever made musically is not to work on more of the songs from All Things Must Pass and to have those two songs in there. But I've always liked For You, Blue. It's a very pleasant song. It's it's fun to listen to. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Okay. We will continue the, this discussion next week with Kit, uh, where she will give us her underappreciated solo songs. Um, you can get a hold of the show by writing Things We Said Today, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page, uh, Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. We have a Twitter account, uh, Things We Said Fab. Um, and I'm going to quickly go around the board and tell everybody uh, or let everybody say where where you can get a hold of us, starting with Kit. Kit, do you want to you want to tell everybody where people can get a hold of you? Sure. You can uh, uh, go to my website, uh, kitotool.com. I am on Facebook. Um, my author page is actually called Kit O'Toole's Keynotes. Uh, so uh, well, look that up. And I'm on Twitter at Kit O'Toole. Okay, uh, Ken? You can reach me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. Also, my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I should mention that um, in my Beatles trivia page, where you can win one of nine prizes every week, for quite a while there, there sits Kit's book called (laughs) Songs We Were Singing, (laughs) Guided Tours to the Beatles' Lesser Known Tracks. Not only can you win her book on my trivia page, but starting this week, this coming Friday, which is the 20th, I'm doing a special contest. I'm bringing back the famous Kiddo Toolkit to give away on, on my website, which is giving away her book, the Beatles book, Songs We Were Singing. Also her book on Michael Jackson called Michael Jackson FAQ and a tote bag for the book, Songs We Were Singing. And that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Okay. So uh, be sure to visit the website. Okay, Alan? Um, the easiest way to reach me is at on Facebook at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And you can get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I have a Beatles page on Facebook called Beatles News and Information that has all of a sudden been booming with new members. And I thank you all for, for joining. And and my art, you can see my articles on Access.com, Variety.com, and Billboard.com. And we're going to get out of here and do this again next week. For Kiddo Tool, for uh, Ken Michaels, and for Alan Cozen, this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today. Thanking also uh, Fab4Radio.com for airing the show on the weekends, and for Michael Lynch for writing our great theme song. We look forward to seeing you and seeing you next week, and we will see you next time. Bye.